Welcome back to Bible study, friends. We're working our way through the book of Genesis, east of Eden. We're studying the life of Joseph. Last week, we left Joseph in a pit. He had been sold by his brothers as a slave into Egypt, and where he was bought by a man named Potiphar, the captain of the guard in Egypt. We're in Genesis chapter 39. Let's begin with a prayer. Father, we invite you to be our teacher tonight. We thank you for your word. What a treasure we hold. Thank you for those who gave their lives so we could read this precious book in English. Now you be our teacher tonight, and may what we learn change the way we think and the way we live. In Jesus' name and for the sake of the kingdom, amen. Let's begin. Here's to you, Mrs. Potiphar. Baby boomers among us will remember Simon and Garfunkel and their Grammy award-winning song, Mrs. Robinson. I've been hearing it in my mind all week. Written for the movie The Graduate, 1967, the lyrics allude to the sordid story of a middle-aged woman, Mrs. Robinson, played by Anne Bancroft, who seduces a 21-year-old college graduate named Benjamin Braddock, played by Dustin Hoffman. The song and the movie are classic examples of the self-absorbed hedonism pleasure-seeking that so often characterized the me generation. I won't try to sing it for you, but here's to you, Mrs. Robinson. Jesus loves you more than you will know. Whoa, whoa, whoa. God bless you, please, Mrs. Robinson. Heaven holds a place for those who pray, hey, hey, hey. If you're my age, those lyrics and those words are lodged in your memory. Well, Genesis chapter 39, I'm at letter B, introduces us, if I can say it this way, to the Mrs. Robinson of the Old Testament. We don't know her first name. All we know is that she is married to a prominent Egyptian official, an officer of the guard named Potiphar. So we'll just call her Mrs. Potiphar. Potiphar. And like Mrs. Robinson in the movie, Mrs. Potiphar in the Bible is famous for one thing and one thing only, seduction. Perhaps her story could be told in the words of the song printed at the end of this study. You'll have to bear with my ways, but this is just how my mind works. As I've tried to recreate the music to fit Genesis 39. And here's to you, Mrs. Potiphar. Jesus loves you more than you will know. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Turn from your sin, Mrs. Robin, Mrs. Potiphar. There's still time to change your ways and pray. Hey, hey, hey. Cuckoo, cuckoo, Mrs. Potiphar. Beneath your plastic face and painted eyes. Whoa, whoa, whoa. We see the slut that you really are, lusting like a spider for some prey. Hey, hey, hey. And then skipping down to the next to the last verse. Where have you gone, Joseph, Jacob's son? Our nation wonders if there is a man, whoa, 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 who can withstand Mrs. Potiphar, resist her charms, and turn and run away. Hey, hey, hey. I won't bore you with the rest, but you get the idea. Mrs. Robinson was to our generation a symbol of seduction that led many young men down a path they didn't want to go. The very same thing is happening when Joseph gets to the glitter and glamour of Egypt. 
country boy going to the big city from the backwaters of Canaan and a family that's religious. They were probably homeschooled. And Joe gets to the big leagues and he meets Mrs. Potiphar. Letter C. Although Mrs. Robinson and Mrs. Potiphar have much in common, Benjamin Braddock and Joseph are complete opposites. Benjamin gets entangled in the web of the wicked spider, Mrs. Robinson, but Joseph escapes. And in our study today, we want to know how he did that. This is the second pit experience for Joseph, which perhaps is more treacherous than the first pit. The first pit was the literal pit, the slavery pit. But Proverbs says that the mouth of a forbidden woman is a deep pit. Proverbs says a prostitute is a deep pit, and an adulteress is a narrow well. Watch out, Joe. Don't fall in this pit. Letter D. This passage is not just about sexual temptation, however. The bigger and more important issue is whether Joseph can maintain his identity as a child of God while he's in Egypt, where he confronts the seductive charms and the siren call of worldliness. Toto, we're not in Kansas anymore. You see, when Joseph gets to Egypt, it's like country boy going to Las Vegas, going to San Francisco, suddenly confronted with the charms and the seductions of worldliness. The land of promise, Canaan, where Joseph comes from, and the faith of his father seem far away when he's in Egypt. The allure of Egyptian thinking and Egyptian living is before him. Joseph is not just being seduced in Egypt. He is being seduced by Egypt. Will he cease to be a Jew? Will he become an Egyptian? That's the question, the big question. Mrs. Potiphar may be the first seductive encounter Joseph and later the Jewish nation has in Egypt, but this will not be the last. In the weeks to come, we'll see this theme over and over of the seduction of thinking like an Egyptian, behaving like an Egyptian, dressing like an Egyptian, shaving like an Egyptian, being buried like an Egyptian? Will the people of God lose their identity while they're living in Egypt? That's the question. Let's begin by reading. I'm in Genesis chapter 39. If you have your Bibles, follow along as I read the first six verses. Now Joseph had been brought down to Egypt, and Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, the captain of the guard, an Egyptian, had bought him from the Ishmaelites who had brought him down there. The Lord was with Joseph. And if you'll notice, the words, the Lord, L-O-R-D, are in capital letters, meaning not the generic name for the deity was with Joseph, but Yahweh, the personal name for the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Yahweh was with Joseph, and he became a successful man, and he was in the house of his Egyptian master. His master saw that Yahweh was with him, not just some generic Egyptian deity, but the God of the Hebrews was with him, and that Yahweh caused all that he did to succeed in his hands. 
So Joseph found favor in his sight and attended him, and he made him overseer in his house and put him in charge of all that he had. From the time that he made him overseer in his house and over all that he had, Yahweh blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. The blessing of Yahweh was on all that he had in house and field. So Potiphar left all that he had in Joseph's charge, and because of him he had no concern about anything except the food he ate. And we're back in our notes. Letter A, under Roman numeral 2, Joseph prospers and thrives because God is with him. Potiphar is an officer, the term that is used, a pharaoh. The term may mean, if you do the research on this term, it may mean he was a eunuch. A eunuch was someone who was castrated. So they could be a faithful, focused servant of the pharaoh or of the king and they wouldn't mess with the king's harem. It's possible that Potiphar was a eunuch. This may explain some of Mrs. Potiphar's behavior. Number two, four times in this chapter, we read two of them here, we are told that the Lord was with Joseph. The word used here is Yahweh the personal name for God. The one accompanying Joseph in Egypt is not a vague, generic deity, the man upstairs, but a personal God with whom one can have a relationship, the God Abraham, Joseph's great-grandfather, the God Abraham worshipped. Number three, Potiphar knew that the blessing of God was on his house because of this Hebrew slave he had bought. This illustrates what God had promised Abraham years ago when he first called him from Ur of the Chaldees, when God said to him, when Yahweh said to him, I will bless those who bless you. And in you, Abraham, and through your descendants, all the families of the earth will be blessed. What a beautiful story we're beginning to see. But the plot thickens. I'm at verse five, verse seven, excuse me. Verse seven, let's pick, continue reading. Now, it's really the second half of verse six. Now, Joseph was handsome in form and appearance. And after a time, incidentally, those very words are used of his mother, Rachel. She was beautiful in form, the shape of her body, the shape of Joseph's body, and their physical attractiveness. Joseph looked like his mother. Verse 7, and after a time, his master's wife, enter Mrs. Potiphar, his master's wife cast her eyes on Joseph. She doesn't beat around the bush. She gets straight to the point. Lie with me. Sleep with me. Come into my chambers. But he refused and said to his master's wife, Behold, because of me, my master has no concern about anything in the house. He's put everything that he has in my charge. He's not greater in this house than I am, nor has he kept back anything from me except yourself, because you are his wife. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? And as she spoke to Joseph day after day, he would not listen to her to lie beside her or to be with her. Her. But one day, when he went into the house to do his work, and none of the men of the house were there in the house, she caught him by his garment, 
saying, lie with me. The only conversation Mrs. Potiphar ever had with poor Joe was this, in Hebrew, it's just two words, sleep with me. That's all she ever said to him. But he left his garment in her hand and fled and got out of that house. And as soon as she saw that he had left his garment in her hand and had fled out of the house, she called to the men of her household and said, See, he has brought among us, meaning my husband, Mr. Potiphar, has brought among us a Hebrew, a Jew, to laugh at us. He came into me to lie with me, and I cried out with a loud voice. And as soon as he heard that I lifted up my voice and cried out, he left his garment beside me and fled and got out of the house. Then she laid up his garment by her until her husband came home. And she told him the same story, saying, The Hebrew servant who you brought among us came in to me to laugh at me. But as soon as I lifted up my voice and cried, he left his garment beside me and fled out of the house. Voila, Mrs. Potiphar. Letter B, Joseph resists seduction because God is with him. Letter A, we have seen Joseph prospers because God is with him. And now it's because this same Yahweh is with him that he's able to resist the charms of this siren seductress woman, the deep pit. Mrs. Potiphar's strategy of seduction is not subtle. Lie with me. In Genesis 34, we saw that Shechem sexually assaults Dinah, a male sexually assaulting a female. Here, we see a female assaulting a male. I find it intriguing in this day of Me Too that the Bible teaches that sexual harassment works both directions. Oh, the wisdom of God's word. Number two, Joseph gives two reasons for resisting Mrs. Potiphar. This would be a sin against, number one, my boss, who happens to be your husband. This would be a betrayal of trust, of his trust in me as the steward of his home. It would be a betrayal of your wedding vows. It would be a sin against my boss, Potiphar. And secondly, it would be a sin against God. We're about 400 years before God gave the Ten Commandments to Moses on Mount Sinai, one of which was, Thou shalt not commit adultery. And yet, 400 years before that, Joe knows this would break God's law. This is counter to God's holy character. Because the God I worship is a covenant-keeping God, and to violate covenants is to violate the character of the one I worship. Joseph lived centuries before the Ten Commandments were given, but he knew adultery was wrong, and he also knew that the eyes of the Lord are in every place. Potiphar might not see what we're doing. My daddy may not see what we're doing. And I may be far from Canaan living in Las Vegas. But God sees. Number three, hell has no fury like a woman scorned. Oh my. Mrs. Potiphar, when she realized realizes that her tricks and strategies of seduction, probably for the first time in her life, have failed. She's furious. She calls the servants and then calls her husband, making a false accusation that Joseph had tried to rape her. She has his clothing to prove it. The perpetrator pretends 
pretends to be a victim. Note how she blames it all on her husband. I'm intrigued by this. I get the impression that Mrs. Potiphar and Mr. Potiphar didn't have a very happy marriage. She blames it on her husband, saying, This servant who you brought into this house, this is your fault, my husband. And the second thing she does is she plays the race card. Twice she says, This Hebrew, this Jew, he's not even Egyptian. Using the race card, the ugly specter of anti Semitism and racism. Twice she calls Joseph a Hebrew. Let's finish the story. Verse 19. As soon as his master heard the words that his wife spoke to him, this is the way your servant treated me, Potiphar's anger was kindled. It doesn't say against whom, but Potiphar's upset. And Joseph's master took him and put him into the prison the place where the king's prisoners were confined, and he was there in prison, which happens to be the prison where Potiphar himself was in charge. But Yahweh, the Lord, was with Joseph. He's in another pit. Joseph is in prison, and the Lord is with him, and showed him steadfast love. The word there is hesed. Beautiful word, covenant faithfulness. Joseph, your circumstances may be terrible, but I've not abandoned you. I'm still with you. I'm going to keep my covenant with you. The Lord was with Joseph and showed him steadfast love and gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. And the keeper of the prison put Joseph in charge of all the prisoners who were in prison, Whatever was done there, he was the one who did it. The keeper of the prison paid no attention to anything that was in Joseph's charge because the fourth time it says it, the Lord, Yahweh, was with him. And whatever he did, the Lord made it succeed. Letter C, Joseph is cast into prison and the Lord is still with him there. Potiphar is angry, but at whom? The text is not precise here. It just says Potiphar is angry. Is he angry at his wife? Is he angry at Joseph? Is he angry at circumstances? He's just lost the steward of his house who has made everything prosper. He's upset. And if Joseph is indeed a rapist, why didn't Potiphar have him immediately killed? That would have been the legal thing to do. Note that Potiphar put Joseph in the prison where he is the warden, a prison for political prisoners, not for criminals. Could it be that Potiphar knows both his wife and Joseph so well that he smells a rat, <laughs> that he is suspicious of his wife's account of what happened. I'm reading between the lines, but I think he does. Number two, Joseph does not defend himself. Perhaps he knows it would be futile. Perhaps he's trusting God and knows that the truth will speak for itself, even if it takes a long time. Number three, but in prison, the Lord showed Joseph steadfast love, covenant faithfulness. You're not forgotten, Joseph. I'm working out a plan. I has not seen, ear has not heard, neither has it entered into your imagination what God has prepared for those who love him. Let's try to summarize what this chapter is about. Roman numeral four, the fire within. Mrs. Potiphar reminds us of the women 
on the television show Desperate Housewives. No, I've never once watched the show, but I know enough about Desperate Housewives and who those stars are playing those roles to know the basic thrust of that television series. Reading between the lines, it seems to me that in Mrs. Potiphar, we have someone who is, number one, beautiful. Egyptian women were known in history for their beauty. Do you know the name Nefertiti? She was the mother-in-law of King Tut. And if I'm not mistaken, the bust of her head, this golden, beautiful neck, beautiful makeup, many have called her the most beautiful woman in history, Nefertiti, this gorgeous woman of Egypt. Or what about Cleopatra and Mark Anthony? It was Blaise Pascal in the 17th century who said if Cleopatra's nose had been shaped differently, human history would be different. It was because of her beauty, made famous more recently by Elizabeth Taylor. But the beauty of Egyptian women is a thing that's often spoken of in history, and I have no doubt that Mrs. Potiphar was a beautiful woman. Perhaps she was a trophy wife, an accessory that General Potiphar liked to escort when he went out on social occasions and people remarked what a beautiful woman she was. Number two, we know this for a fact, she was wealthy. This woman was pampered. She was married to a powerful man. She had servants, lived in a big house. Number three, I'm reading between the lines a bit, but I believe she was bored. She had servants to do her work. No pressures for her to be gainfully employed outside the home. She had time on her hands to lounge around the swimming pool, to eat, to take boat trips on the Nile. Number four, she was confident. Perhaps she had lured Potiphar into marrying her by the way she batted her eyelashes, by the way she knew how to seduce and attract. Perhaps she had seduced others. She knows the drill, what bathrobe to wear, at what time she should sun around the pool in her swimsuit, what perfumes to wear, making eye contact, a touch on the shoulder, soft words, and then the words invitation, lie with me. This strategy had served her well in life, but for some reason with this Jewish slave, her strategy didn't work. Number five, reading between the lines, I think she was trapped in a loveless marriage. Her husband is married to his work and is often away from home. And if Potiphar is indeed a eunuch, it only heightens her need for love and emotional connection. There you have Mrs. Potiphar. Let her be. Other factors are also at work in this story of seduction that makes Joseph's ability to resist her temptations and charms even more difficult. Number one, Joseph is handsome. There's only a few people in Scripture, men at least, that the Bible emphasizes they were strikingly good-looking. David was one. Absalom was one. Joseph is one. He was handsome in form and appearance. Perhaps we might say he was buff. He had pecs and abs. He was shaped in a way that drew the eye. He was a good-looking young man, well-built. He was also single. He was in his early 20s. 
and he caught the eye of Mrs. Potiphar. Number two, Mrs. Potiphar is Joseph's social superior. What do you do when your boss or your boss's wife makes a pass at you? The playing field is not level here. Refusing her advances could ruin your career. When Bill Clinton had a relationship with a White House intern, 23 years of age, what do you do when the President of the United States is messing with an intern? The playing field is not level. Number three, Joseph's work required him often to be alone in the house where Mrs. Potiphar lived. This wasn't his fault. He wasn't looking for opportunities. He was being faithful to his job. Number four, Mrs. Potiphar's seductive flirtation is constant. It's one thing to resist temptation once. But for Joseph, it was day after day after day, like dripping water. At some point, your defenses will be down, won't they? And number five, Joseph could easily justify giving in to her advances. Think how many reasons he had to say yes. She's my boss. And she's the one initiating this. I deserve a little fun. This might advance my career. No one will ever know. There's no law against this. There's no Ten Commandments. And besides, my whole family is sexually messed up. I gave you a footnote there that just records some in just Joseph's family the sexual misconduct that is part of his own legacy. Why can't I just have an afternoon of fun with Mrs. Potiphar? Letter C. This is really the heart of what I want to share with you in this study. The message of this passage is this. Be prepared. I was a Boy Scout growing up. That's the Boy Scout motto. Be prepared. When the moment of seduction came, Joseph was ready. A soldier who waits until the first shots are fired to check his equipment. Do I have my rifle? Is it well oiled? Do I have enough ammunition? A soldier who lives like that is probably going to be a casualty on the battlefield. So will a man or a woman who is unprepared when the siren voices of sexual temptation come. Not if they come, but when they come. The Bible includes stories like Joseph and Mrs. Potiphar and Samson and Delilah, and David, and Bathsheba. These stories are in the Bible. Why? Because God wants us to talk about these things. That's the blank. Wants us to talk. He wants the church to preach sermons about this. He wants Tuesday night Bible study groups to occasionally hit this topic that God wants us to talk about these things, and so be prepared when the temptation comes, because it will come. Here, at least the way I've laid it out, are five things you and I can do to prepare for sexual temptation. Five things we can do to prepare for the temptations that come in this area. Number one, are you with me? Number one, cultivate and maintain a vital relationship with Jesus Christ or with Yahweh, with God. 
cultivate and maintain not a religion, but a living, vital walk, a relationship with Jesus Christ. Four times in this passage, we're told the Lord was with Joseph. They walked together every day. They talked together every day. They had a relationship that was real and vital. If Joseph had waited to develop his relationship with the Lord until Mrs. Potiphar walked into the room with her bathrobe, it would have been too late. Joseph had victory over temptation because he had a solid, daily, personal walk with the living Lord. Walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Galatians 5.16 Remember the hymn, I need thee every hour, stay thou dear nearby. Temptations lose their power when thou art nigh. When the Holy One is present, Temptations fail. That's how it works. Joseph was able to stay sexually pure because he cultivated and maintained a relationship with God. Here's a second thing we can do to be successful in standing strong against sexual temptation. Number two, it's just three letters. R-U-N, run, flee, do a 180 degree turn and get out of that house, Joe, as fast as your legs can take you. When Mrs. Potiphar propositioned Joseph, lie with me, the text says he fled and got out of the house. Joseph didn't pause to think about it, to discuss the matter, and he didn't try to witness to Mrs. Potiphar. Mrs. Potiphar, if you've heard of the four spiritual laws, not the moment to do so. With many temptations, in fact, with most temptations, the Bible exhorts us to stand and fight. But when it comes to sexual temptation, the Bible tells us to turn and run. Every second counts. In mentoring young Timothy, Paul exhorts him to flee youthful passions. Timothy, run! When I was in college, two cousins of mine, Danny Key being one of them, we went to New Orleans to ring bells for the Salvation Army over Christmas break, where my Aunt Marjorie was a major in the Salvation Army. We stood by cat kettles and rang a bell. I occasionally played a trumpet during those Christmas holidays. It's a wonderful memory. But we were in New Orleans. One of the kettles that Christmas was on the corner of Canal Street and Bourbon Street. Well, I knew a little bit about New Orleans, and I knew about Bourbon Street, and we begged Aunt Marjorie, Aunt Marjorie, please take us to Bourbon Street. Show us what's down that street. One morning, if I remember, it was about 11 o'clock in the morning, she said, okay, I'm going to show you Bourbon Street. And she basically said, follow me. We started out, she was walking fast. She said, boys, Keep your eyes straight ahead. <laughs> she walked down Bourbon Street. We got to St. Charles Square at the other end. Before I knew it, she said, okay, you've seen Bourbon Street. You never need to go down that street again. Because she knew the power of the seductive voices and images, especially for a young man. And she said, walk fast, run, don't tarry. Every second counts, run. Don't stand and fight the temptation, 
The most sanctified, spirit-filled thing you can do when sexual temptation comes is run like a jackrabbit. Get out of the house. Number three, make a covenant with your eyes. The Bible emphasizes how temptation often makes its first beachhead in our hearts by getting our eyes focused on some forbidden fruit, like Mrs. Potiphar. For men, the battle is usually won or lost with the eyes. This explains why Job said, I've made a covenant with my eyes not to look lustfully at a girl. In a culture like ours, where we are constantly bombarded with visual stimuli, magazines, billboards, TV ads, the internet, we may not be able to control the first look, but God does expect us to control the second. Steve Arterburn, in his important book, Every Man's Battle, urges men to learn how to bounce their eyes. What an interesting way to say it. What he says is, when your eyes land on an image that is provocative, that is erotic, let your eyes bounce. Don't Stay there. Or I love the way Martin Luther said it so picturesquely. I can't stop the birds from flying over my head, but I can stop them from building a nest in my hair. When it comes to sexual temptation, I don't know a better refrain to sing than what we learned in vacation Bible school as children. Oh, be careful, little eyes what you see. Oh, be careful, little eyes, what you see, for the Father up above is looking down in love. Oh, be careful, little eyes, what you see. Number four, be accountable. If you're married, listen to your wife. She has antenna about other women, particularly that men don't seem to have. I learned early in my marriage that it would drive me crazy what Katie would say to me about the vibes she got from other women. But I learned she was right all the time. The fear of Katie is the beginning of wisdom, for me at least. Share your struggles in a small group of trusted friends. Be accountable. Confess your sins one to another. Pray for one another that you may be healed. Sin thrives in isolation. So be connected. Find a place you can talk about the temptations you have. So, so far we've seen four ways to stand strong against sexual temptation. Number one was cultivate and maintain a relationship with Jesus Christ. Number two was run. Number three was make a covenant with your eyes. Number four was be accountable. Now, number five, because it takes more than behavior modification. The gospel is not about behavior modification. That's a result of living the gospel. Our behaviors are modified, but that's not what the gospel is. I'm going to say, get at the heart of the gospel in these terms. Number five, fight fire with fire. Fight the fire of lust with the fire of the Holy Spirit, with the fire of Pentecost. The best way to control the raging passion of lust is to find another passion that burns even hotter. Firefighters in the forest will often fight a big fire by starting another fire. They fight fire with fire. 
And there's only one fire I know that is hotter than the fire of lust, which is hot. And that is the fire of Pentecost. The Holy Spirit. This is what Thomas Chalmers was talking about when he preached a famous sermon 150 years ago called The Expulsive Power of a New Affection. The blank there. Expulsive power. It's a power that expels things, that pushes things away. And a new affection that is stronger than the old affection has an expulsive power. It's a wonderful sermon. You can Google it and still read it. The expulsive power of a new affection. Let me illustrate how it works. When I was in college, in my dorm room, I had a little hot pot that boiled water. And I had next to the hot pot a jar of instant coffee. And this was very cool, very high tech, very cutting edge in the day to be able to boil water and use instant coffee and drink it in your room. And how I loved instant coffee. But one day, I was introduced to something called Starbucks and I've never had a cup of instant coffee since. The expulsive power of a new affection. Why would you want to drink instant coffee when you've discovered something called Starbucks? Oh my goodness, you get the idea. Incidentally, do you know what the logo is for Starbucks, the next time you're at Starbucks, look at the cup. What is the logo? It's a siren, S-I-R-E-N, a woman. I'm not talking about a siren on the top of a, of a police car, although the words are related. A siren comes from Greek mythology. These were the women who were on the island, who lured sailors to their death. And the logo of Starbucks is a siren woman, topless. Now she's got long hair that covers what needs to be covered, but she's a seductress. She's luring you in with the aromas of the place. Come to me, come to me, come to me. That's what Starbucks is all about. It's about seduction. Well, when you turn that into the realm of sexuality, we've got to find an expulsive power that burns hotter and is more passionate than that of erotic sexuality. And there's only one, and that comes from Pentecost. Victory over sexual temptation does not come through discipline and hard work alone. Real victory comes only when we experience a passion that burns hotter and brighter than carnal lust. Let me close this way. Greek mythology tells of two different methods used by sailors in mythology to get safely past the island of the sirens, those women I was just talking about. Beautiful women sought to lure passing ships by their seductive beauty and enticing voices. But when the sailors went closer for a better look, they would shipwreck on the rocky coast and be lost. There were two ways Ships got past. At least there's two stories about two ships trying to get past this island of seductive women. First bullet there is Ulysses. This story is told in the Odyssey. Ulysses had his men put wax in their ears and then lash him to the mast. When passing the island, 
He pled with his men to untie him. He heard their voices, and he couldn't resist wanting to go there. But his men couldn't hear the voices, so they kept rowing. They were able to pass, but only by physical restraint. Though their actions were outwardly moral, and they didn't crash, their hearts remained polluted and filled with lust. Do you understand? They got by, but just because they physically tied Ulysses to the mast so that he couldn't do what he wanted in his polluted heart to do. Now there's another story. This will preach. Jason and the Argonauts. Jason found a much better method. Passing the island, he commanded Orpheus to play his magic harp. And the sound of his music was sweeter and more enticing than the music of the siren women singing from the shore. Their seductive charms were lost, and they lost all their power as the melodious music of heaven overpowered the fleshly chorus of earth. It's the expulsive power of a new affection. Jason found a music that was more seductive than that of the siren voices. It was the music played by the magic harp. If we're going to have victory over the siren voices of worldliness and sensuality around us, we have to find a passion that burns hotter and brighter, with a greater intensity than carnal lust. Conclusion. The gospel offers victory over sexual temptation, not so much by forceful willpower and coercion. It's not by tying yourself up so you can't do what you really want to do but by transforming our loves and desires. It promises more than behavior modification. It promises a new heart. The gospel promises a new heart. Christ does not wish to annihilate our passions. He wants to sanctify them. That's worth the entire Bible study right there. Christ does not want to annihilate our passions. He created them. He wants to sanctify our passions, make them pure, so that our passions become fixated on the right things and not the wrong things. The fire of the Spirit enabling us to love God with all of our being is stronger than the fire of fleshly lust. That's the message of the gospel. Listen to how Paul talks about sanctification and how he ties sanctification to human sexuality in 1 Thessalonians. Listen to what he says. These are the verses I close with. This is the will of God. Your sanctification. Now look how he puts there a colon. In other words, I want to talk about sanctification, but let me tell you what I mean by sanctification. This is God's will for you, your sanctification. What I mean is that you abstain from sexual immorality. That each of you know how to control his own body in holiness and honor, not in the passion of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God. For God has not called us for impurity, but in holiness. Therefore, whoever disregards this disregards not man, but God, who gives us his Holy Spirit. 
That's what the sanctifying spirit was sent at Pentecost to do, to render pure our passions. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for the story of Joseph and the amazing way he remained pure in the midst of seduction, in the midst of the charms of Mrs. Potiphar. Father, we thank you for sending your sanctifying spirit at Pentecost that does so much more than help us modify our behavior, that does so much more than giving us tools to tie us to the mast so we don't do bad things, but that your spirit comes to purify our hearts, to make us new creations, to make us pure, to enable us to have a passionate desire for those things you want us to desire. Work in us. Don't give up on us until the work is done. In the name of Jesus and for the sake of the kingdom, we pray. Amen. God bless you. We'll see you next week.